Sol Yard, The Dark Moon. Uh, this is a solo exhibition by Gordon and Dr. Janiver, uh, produced and curated by Ionized Space and very generously supported by uh, Mimosa House. Um, this is our evening panel, which is called Pins in Precarity, Politics and Power. Uh, this is our first curatorial project, is Ionized Space. So for us, it's even more special that you've taken the time to join us this evening. So thank you for coming with us. Um, just to introduce us as Iron of Iron Space, we're a nomadic contemporary arts project based in London, uh, founded by Indira Dirisabea Vazirbeck and assisted by myself, Phoebe Bradley White. Uh, we work on a diverse range of projects that showcase art from an interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, we work with international artists and curators to deliver contemporary exhibitions, artist residencies, uh, commercial and non-commercial arts projects, and educational events like today's panel and hopefully a lot more as we grow and develop. Uh, we're centred on learning, research and experimentation within our own practice and we're driven to platform and showcase an international roster of multidisciplinary, radical and impactful art and artists. And we also want to take the time again to thank the Mosa House for all of their support and for making this such a smooth and effortless success. So we've decided to hold this panel today just because the work is so rich and nuanced and full of so much symbolism that we wanted to create an opportunity to really spend some time exploring and navigating the artwork. And tonight I'm really thrilled to be uh, introducing an incredible group of creative minds that are going to be discussing the work today. So firstly, we have Godwin Lopajanova. She is a Kazakh artist currently working in Berlin, Germany, and she joins us today from Berlin. She uses the materials of traditional Kazakh handicrafts to explore the complexities of post-nomadic identities, cultural alienation, and the effects of globalization. She completed her studies in Almaty and in Berlin, and being based in Berlin for over 10 years has helped her understand and critically analyze not only the situation in her home country and the Central Asian region, but global issues that can be universally synthesized and experienced. She's participated in group exhibitions internationally, including France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, Russia, Kazakhstan, the UK and South Korea. And she's also showcased her work in multiple solo exhibitions, such as in Almaty, in Berlin and in Moscow. And she'll be creating an exhibition in Paris next year. Next, we have Indira Dusebeva Ziyavec, who is right here an independent curator and co-founder of the International Art Development Association, a non-profit organisation supporting and promoting contemporary art from Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Uh, she's also now the founder of Iron Line Space. She holds an MA in Art History in UCL and has curated and co-curated numerous international projects, including uh, the project of the National Museum Focus Kazakhstan post nomadic Mind at Wapping Hydraulic Power Station, uh, the private pavilion of Kazakhstan One Step Forward that was held during the 55th Venice Biennale as part of the IADA projects, and the first international exhibition, The Other Side of Midnight, at the National Museum of the Republic of Kazakhstan, which was a solo show of British Israeli artist Saluk Ben David. We then have Dr. Diana Kudaganova, who is a political sociologist based in Cambridge. She received her PhD in 2015 from the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. Her first book, Rewriting the Nation in Modern Kazakh Literature, explores the study of nationalism, modernization, and cultural development in modern Kazakhstan. Her second book, Towards Nationalizing Regimes, Conceptualizing Power and Identity in the Post-Soviet Realm, focuses on the rise of nationalizing regimes in post-Soviet space after 1991. And currently she's completing her third book, a manuscript on power, state and resistance in contemporary art of the post-Soviet Eurasia, and is working on a new project that engages with state and regime theory. Dr. Maya Koshkeli is a psychoanalyst and a member of the British Psychoanalyst Society, and she's currently in full-time practice in London. She teaches psychoanalytic theory at IOPA, BPA, and UCL. Besides being a psychoanalyst, she's been involved in various artistic pursuits, and her main area of interest is an overlap of creativity and psychoanalysis. Her 2017 paper, Beyond Words, won the Winnicott Essay Prize, marking the publication of the collected works of D.W. Winnicott by Oxford University Press 
in 2017. And her paper, Holding and Visceral Attention, Bodily Concentration with an Analyst Under COVID-19 Lockdown, won the Rosika Parker Prize in 2020 run by the Journal of British Psychotherapy, where it was published. So we have an incredible group of creative minds today that will be working through this work with us. So uh, without further ado, I will pass you over to Indira, who will moderate the discussion today. Thank you, Vicky. Um, and thanks uh, for joining us tonight. Um, it's been already six weeks since we've opened the show, and uh, many people came to to see it, and it was an incredible uh, opportunity for us to, uh, you know, speaking to the to these visitors and hear their um, responses. We've actually shared some of them on our Instagram account, but I'd still like to read them tonight. So the first one: When I see the more abstract, minimal parts of the horizon. All I see is the endless expanse of the step, steps, so open and flat. Next. I think the flowers pierced into the soil create a second horizon line, like golden sunrise or sunset, breaking the plane of the horizon. The third one. At first, I was drawn to the beauty of the fabric. But over time, its fragility makes it feel more melancholic and uncertain. And the last one. I see these spinnings as outlines of countries. They make me think of limits, boundaries, and borders. So it's been, um, it's beautiful that each uh, visitor had this uh, very own encounter and this uh, dialogue with the artwork. Um, being totally immersed into it. And today we have this uh, unique opportunity to speak and to hear the souls of the artist uh, about the project. Uh, so Gunur, we would like to ask you to share with us uh, what brought you to this project. Uh, this, uh, this installation was a site-specific um, exhibition for Mimosa House and you've selected the to, you decided to create this horizon line. What is the significance of this horizon line? And maybe you can also uh, tell us more about the soundscape that we don't hear now, but it's usually present. Um, about the soundscape that, like, again, it has this um, fully immersive experience. Can you unmute yourself? Unmute it. Thank you, thank you, Indira, thank you, Diana, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody, also to come uh, to enjoy. Um, um, yes, I, um, I'm actually excited to go here because when I talk about my life, it is uh, so. Uh, the emotion, uh, the emotions uh, coming up. And, uh, um, this horizontal line is uh, actually come after the show when uh, it was uh, in 2018 um, by, uh, created by um, Idea and Alia uh, in uh, uh, Hydraulic Power Station. So I created an um, um, installation, and when I saw this installation in um, uh, at the end when it was uh, everything was finished in this uh, big um, um, rooms, this was um, and there is not only one. There is this, the the old building is uh, have also own history and have also um, I don't know all, 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 it's. Um, uh, give me to think, um, uh, to continue uh, this um, idea, the concept of the installation. So I then I came into this idea of um, to create this um, uh, horizontal line and uh, um, 
Yes, it is um, it's a reflex to um, actually everything to which uh, happening today. This is kind of a, um, um, this is a kind of a, um, um, yes, attraction, um, new reflection, uh, reflection, reflection of uh, uh, of. The, our time of our society and uh, um, um, yes, this is a, it's a very bad current and glittery fabrics uh, at times possible to tear your eyes away but all the glitter is just the illusion when the light um, as uh, to another matter which uh, I leave uh, each individual to decide. Yeah, this is uh, um, what we are creating. So, but the reality is uh, different. The reality is um, um, somewhere deep inside on everybody. So, yes. And maybe you can tell us about the soundscape, about your collaboration with a German musician. Yes, um, yes. During the process, yes, where I came to this idea that the sound, the music, uh, music is um, is uh, like a complement um, the whole concept to to give more deeper um, feelings, emotions. So um, I had the chance uh, to meet this uh, composer and. Uh, um, yes, a German composer and a musician, and uh, yes, we uh, create. I just uh, talked about uh, about the conception of uh, so uh, work and everything. So and the soul that we create together, yeah, because uh, um, at the beginning it was not the. Uh, it was not clear what kind of sound we need, so and then slowly by slowly, it's also because the there is the influence of what uh, happens now in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the influence, uh, like uh, we, I want to hear also some kind of voices, the echoes from the people, also from um, um, everyday life, you know, like steps. So. Uh, yeah, and um, um, in the end, yeah, I was, um, I think it um, was a good idea to align the techniques and yeah. Uh, uh, Gunur, one of the most discussed parts of your work uh, is this uh, use of the pins. Uh, could you tell us about the process of making uh, this work and uh, why pins are so significant for you? Yes, uh, with the pins I start to work uh, in 2014. I start to work um, experiment and uh, it, it, it came like um, um, normally during the uh, working process in my studio. So when I start to cut with this um, um, motifs uh, uh, cut out from the so from these different fabrics, so I was uh, thinking um, how should I use uh, how should I fix them? So to glue it was no gluing associated with the cheap Chinese uh, stuff which is full in Kazakh uh, mass. So um, to stitch, it take already another direction. So, and then I understand that the process, actually the process is because of, it's kind of, because it reflects to the process of my life, like from, I think um, also in our society, the process of life from every day, which everybody, every personality creates the small things which they 
after the time they came and something big like uh, I don't know what happened in politics in uh, each country, yeah, or, or global, um, uh, in growth value. So that way I, I, I start to uh, yes, use the themes because it's um, symbolizing yes, the fragility, symbolizing also um, the emotions, um, uh, something which is uh, very um, unstable, so unstability. Uh, something which uh, can change um, immediately or disappear. So, and then it became um, my kind of tools which I'm using and still um, uh, every time for every uh, work during every process is like first time. It's very uh, touching me a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gunnur. Um, I remember when we discussed um, your work um, at the beginning, uh, you mentioned this uh, mass mourning period during the pandemic. And, uh, but I also know that uh, your emotional state was uh, shattered uh, further, um, same like actually the emotional state of all people from Kazakhstan, um, when the nationwide unrest took place in the, in the beginning of January this year. Uh, that is now remembered as uh, Kanda Kantar, um, the bloody January. And uh, many people died and hundreds were arrested. The internet heavily documents the information that those people arrested uh, were subjected to physical torture. Uh, yet uh, the state officials they denied. Um, and the end of February, beginning of March, uh, it became even more bloodier when uh, the war broke out in Ukraine. Uh, as though the whole world is experiencing this phase of dark moon. Um, and as you mentioned, Bruno, you grieve those lives lost and uh, I presume you think about the transience of being and this uh, fragility that you're mentioning, fragility of body and the fragility of life. Uh, and it seems like Olara is so painfully uh, relevant today. And in my curatorial text, I refer to the work of uh, philosopher Judith Butler. Um, uh, the work is called Precarious Life, the Power of Mourning and Violence. And even though this text refers to a completely uh, different uh, tragical moment, uh, I believe this text has its universality talking about very important questions um, that Judith Butler uh, raises, such as who counts as human? Whose lives count as lives? What makes for a grievable life? And it's been 18 years since the book was published, uh, but uh, all these questions seems more than untimely. And Butler appeals uh, to all people despite any differences and highlights the social vulnerability uh, of our bodies. Uh, there are actually two sentences uh, that I would like to read and discuss them in relation to our exhibition. And uh, hear sort of uh, Maya and Diana. So Butler writes, uh, loss and vulnerability seem to follow from our being socially constituted bodies, attached to others, at risk of losing those attachments, exposed to others, at risk of violence by virtue of that exposure. And then she continues, perhaps what I have lost in you, that for which I have no ready vocabulary is a relationality that is composed neither exclusively of myself uh, nor you, but is to be conceived as a tie by which those terms are differentiated and related. So Butler highlights that uh, in these global tragedies, uh, the grief should not be solitary and private and so depoliticized. Instead, this grief should be considered political and experience within the complexities um, of our communities and relationally tied 
by fundamentally uh, fundamental dependency and ethical responsibility. So, my Diana, uh, we would like to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I have very, very brief um, reflection on this thing. Um, and maybe this is more like opening up these questions. Um, that, um, um, so I'm going to uh, read it. Um, so I think Odiara captures poetically the phenomenon of transformation. It's dark, hidden, the most frightening, and an uncertain period of it, that of mourning. When we lose, we enter the Odiara phase without knowing whether we will be found what we have lost. We are in the dark, like in the grave, but we are also in the dark before being born. The dark moon could also be the pregnant womb. I think in Guno's work, the dialectics of being, that of the birth and death, destruction and creativity, beginning and ending, are pinned together in a precarious, hence dynamic reality, I think expressing the ultimate human condition. When I'm looking at these pins, my skin prickles with horror. Suddenly, I, and unexpectedly, I remember how the blood samples were taken from my fingers when I was a child. It is uncanny. I find myself in the space of familiar and unfamiliar. It touches me deeply. Piercing the skin ego, catching the drift of long forgotten memories. It evokes a wound. The sight of blood drops on my finger. Well, Elvira has pointed out that Gunu's work reflects cultural trauma that wounded the contemporary society resulting in the loss of identity. Both levels, that individual and collective, are at once present and active in your work, Gunu, I think. Mm -hmm. There is an intrinsic link between the memory and subjectivity. Our subjectivity is constructed out of our memories and of, of, and of what we cannot remember. I guess I take up that point while then do the social aspect. Mm -hmm. So psychoanalytically speaking, we are constructed out of our memories, which are conscious or remembered, but most importantly, uh, what we cannot remember anymore but they are still very powerful and active in us. So psychoanalytically speaking, uh, unconscious, unremembered selves, ourselves, is the most powerful in defining who we are and how we are. Freud, in 1915, just before the outbreak of the First World War, wrote a paper on mourning and melancholia, where he gives metapsychological description of the process of mourning. When we lose someone we love, we lose not only the object of our love, but the most importantly and poignantly, the part of our love we invested in this object. Through the process of mourning, we attempt to regain in our internal world what we have lost in the external world. Freud and Carl Abraham, who was his contemporary and his disciple, and studied melancholia especially in detail, spoke about the orality of the mourning process, the need to take in, interject the lost object. Freud said that the self was the graveyard of the lost objects. So this is who we are internally. Unless the lost object is destroyed, it destroys you. It's a paradox here. Like it happens in case of melancholia, the process of mourning comes to an end spontaneously in normal case, where the lost object is given up, when I accept that I've lost someone. It's no longer, it doesn't, it does not exist anymore. However, if what we lose is bigger than we are, the lost object takes over, splits us, the subject who becomes defined by the open wound. Freud brings the visual metaphor to describe the state, that state of being. The shadow of the object fell upon the ego. This is a quote from him, very famous. 
And in my view, it is a psychoanalytic conception of the oliara, uh, the shadow of the object or upon the uh, uh, ego. Ego has a self. So melancholia is an endless mourning, the inability to mourn and, and finish it, let it go. Here we have a link with the concept of trauma. In short, the trauma is an undigested, unmetabolized psychic event, which like a foreign body lodges in us. What is not transformed through mourning is transmitted intergenerationally. The biggest problem with it, I think, is its invisibility. You know, this is a sort of a body part that it cannot be seen. And we find a generation, a generation, who lost the sight of what has displaced its identity. Everything has been erased, perhaps except the disturbing sense of alienation. Ogunov's work pinpoints the traumatized body and engages us in the experiential dialogue. Hints, I think, it's my evocative take on it, highlight fragility not only, but also transitionality of holding. There is a temporal dimension of anticipating the loss, precarious holding, fear of falling forever. Yet, there seems to be the comforting illusion, and here we come, I think, Together, like I said, there is an illusion, you say, in Pilitzer, in Kala. But I also think that there is also this illusion, comfort illusion of the reversibility of what has not yet been stitched. Because it's pinned. Mm -hmm. So it has not yet been stitched. So there is this, I think, uh, illusion that it, that it is in flux. Mm -hmm. You know, it reminded me, it's a very kind of, uh, it, again, my home and uh, and even in, 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 now, in my reality even now, but when a um, fabric um, is, uh, when a cloth is made, before it's stitched, it's pinned mm -hmm. and measured. Yes, absolutely. And this is something about that, that it's a transitional state, it's not yet stitched. So you can mm -hmm. make it longer, shorter, it, you can do it, there is sort of a reversibility to it. So it is, I think, in flux. So I think for me it's, from my psychoanalytic angle, I think it's important that we capture both. Uh, there is something about this. Uh, uh, okay, you expose it fragility, but also you create a comfort illusion of its reversibility. Mm -hmm. It's in, in flux. Uh, it's in between, in between cut and stitch. Mm -hmm. Pins also stand. I think it's very obvious, but I need to say for the psychic pain. The pain of being in touch with the loss. The process of mourning is painful. And mourning too involves cutting and destroying what was lost, out of which memories need to be created. Memories. Memory also is a form of refining the lost object, idea, country. And just to finish is that, like memories, these put prints in the gallery, if you notice that they, they are created now as we come in and go. And they are also traces, the non-verbal narratives of the journey. So psychoanalytically speaking, nothing is lost ever. It changes in form. Mm. Thank you. That's great. Oh, it was very poetic, <laughs> Maya. Yeah. That is an impact it had on me. Yeah, and uh, I think you covered all my further questions about <laughs> it, you know, like the pins and layers, uh, but it's all beautifully... Um, yes. It's yes, very beautifully beautiful. expressed. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, this is, um, really this is like in between, because uh, often when I'm working, I mean, I... Um, very often I can't find the right words to describe uh, what I want to say. So uh, thank you that uh, you 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 get more deeper and uh, um, this is very nice also for me. It's really um, very important, yeah, to that uh, other people can feel it like more. As I can say with my words, mm -hmm. but they feel from from the materials, from the objects. And I also was I was also thinking when you say about memory, about uh, 
culture is really uh, um, like this because uh, uh, the installation uh, with the ears, yeah. Um, this is, um, uh, you know, it, it came first when I lost my uh, two uncles during COVID. But this loss, it um, um, bring me to the past to think about my ancestors. So to think about this uh, hunger time, Yeah, the uh, Yes, and also the time of the fighting repression. So how many people um, go away without to want it? Because the, the, the people they want to live, the people want to change something, people want to just um, 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 enjoy their lives. And uh, they, but they, they passed. Um, so these two uh, uncles, uh, and then after this, uh, um, after this uh, January, Lutu January in Kazakhstan, is the same. I was like, how I don't know. Was thinking about all these people, also uh, small children. Like this is the people they didn't. They did, they just uh, want to change something. They just uh, uh, want to. Um, um, get the own um, um, freedom of speech. Yes. Freedom of speech, yes. So, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, like this, all the people they now, uh, and maybe they, uh, the, the souls of this, they already now like our ancestors, you know, like the souls of our ancestors, they get together. I mean, they somewhere the souls connected so in, in the ears so this is the ears which is some um, the like, really also natural material which I want to use also in my show in this, in this installation and this um, pins and there's uh, flowers cut it up and it's just like a, this, uh, this uh, suffer this uh, um, a month deceit false huh deceit deceit something that is deceit yes lie yeah and this is like uh, this also um, I mean this um, from this this uh, from this because yeah it's ca coming from the uh, small thing to the um, Living in the, you know, to go to the past to see, to hear, to listen, and anal uh, analyzing it. And this is just like also this mem memories because so, so many things are still didn't uh, answer. There is so many questions it's open. Uh, there, there, this, uh, there is a lot of um, important um, moments from the, our history. It's like uh, was the taboo. Uh, we didn't. I didn't know anything when I lived in Kazakhstan. I started to uh, research everything when I came uh, first uh, to Germany, because there it's like kind of um, when you are living there, you, you you don't see everything what happened uh, in the world. Um, I don't know what's um, this is my my opinion in Kazakhstan maybe in my study. Um, you are so there is so many uh, small things taking a lot of attention, and uh, we don't talk about it at home. Also, this is the problem I think maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, uh, Benur, uh, for the last I think. Uh, Decade, she was uh, researching the historical uh, period, historical trauma, cultural trauma uh, of Kazakhstan, um, and she also reflects in her work on the 
contemporary period, uh, what is happening now. Um, and I think uh, earlier uh, we, we were thinking a lot about the title for this exhibition. And I think Olara reflects it really well because uh, Olara is a Kazakh word that um, uh, that is trans that translates as a dead moment, and it consists of two words: uh, dead uh, Ola is dead, and Ara is in between. And this word uh, used to be associated with the most uh, darkest period, and a lot of writers they um, actually they took this word as a metaphor, and uh, they. There is one writer called uh, Tolen Abdikov who wrote his historical novel in 1985 and uh, this story is actually about the period of 1930s and this period is a period of um, sedentarization uh, when nomadic people became sedentary uh, when uh, the period of also collectivization and we can call it colonization as well so um, we saw that this, uh, this work would uh, beautifully describe uh, uh, what is happening today. It will reflect the reality, but also will capture the historical uh, importance and meaning uh, that is uh, layered in the works of Guinur. So um, Diana, maybe we can uh, hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. I think it's it's a, it's a great um, title and it's a great concept to to cover so many things that Gunnur um, kind of like wanted to present in this exhibition. And I'm trying to remember and think about when when I first came in and we had this discussion that it encompasses the time that is not just connected to one event, but time in general, the time of darkness, and unfortunately the time of trauma that we're seeing even now. I, I know that uh, for a lot of people in Kazakhstan, January, the beginning of January was quite unexpected and it was a very painful uh, period, but then it, it smoothly sort of transformed into this period of tortures that um, very well people knew about, but, but I think coming back to that idea of Butler's sort of socially constructed bodies is that these bodies were constantly hidden from us and that was something that, that also added to the traumatic experience of not knowing what's going on to these people, not knowing how many of them are alive and, and how many of them will come out of the, of the prison um, cells and, and, and tortures that they're experiencing. But then that sort of moment of a very torturous um, end of January, beginning of February, transformed then into what was going on in Russia at the time. And I think for people in, the, in this particular space, or Eurasia or whatever we want to call it now, because I think I think post-Soviet will be highly problematic nowadays, but um, we felt the beginning of the war quite er much earlier than 24th of February, um, when the physical invasion happened. So for, I think that that time and sort of that time of darkness kind of transformed, and mm -hmm. we're still in that darkness. We're still seeing mm -hmm. so many people dying, um, and and yeah, it's it's just unfortunate in in, in a way of sort of um, we don't even know when it's going to end. But then. Oilara, I think, is also connected to this idea of a very deep and long um, decolonization that is happening in this particular region. And I think what, what Gunnur spoke about uh, just now, sort of, um, I'm trying to connect, sort of weave together different things of how and why people don't remember or don't think, um, not all the people, but, but generally that, that people kind of like are more eager to think of traditions in this very uh, catchy, modern, um, very sort of glittery aspect of, of cheap fabrics when the meaning of the old traditions of, of fabric itself and exchange is kind of downplayed um, is, is part of the decolonization done in, not in sort of the way that it was done elsewhere because we often forget that colonialism the way it happened in the majority of the world was always overseas. Uh, the empire would retrieve of course for longer periods of time but the empire would be somewhere centrally located far away physically and geographically. Whereas Russia is a settler colonialism, and we're still debating sort of what happened in the Soviet Union, although a lot of people are saying now it's, it was a period of colonialism. And what happens then with decolonization when the settler empire is still there? Um, and that's, I think, what Ukraine is clearly showing us now, is that their move toward decolonization brought to a very painful kind of retreat back to the empire. Mm -hmm. and, and similarly, um, the idea of Kazakhstan not speaking of its traumas of the famine, um, well, called Holodomor in, in Ukraine, but it's called Ashashulok in Kazakhstan, is equally part of the same story of the very painful decolonization, where certain things have to be unspoken, but sort of almost filling the air and everybody knows about it. It's, it's almost like, you know, your elusive 
um, pins that are that are holding something, and people know that these pins are there, even though you cannot see them from far away. But this also there is this inability to speak about it openly, and this constant um, state of whispering and silencing oneself uh, from talking about these things. Mm -hmm. So I think going around is also about that, about about this internal silence that becomes super personal and individualized when it's you're torturing your body by not being able to speak the truth, whether we're talking about the early colonization and famine in the 1930s, whether we're talking about Stalinist depressions, uh, or whether we're talking about the Handu uh, Handar or the bloody January in, in, in nowadays, because a lot of people are still scared to talk about it. So I think it's, it's, it's really this deep combination on many distinct levels, and I completely agree with Maya that it's also a, a, a psychological, in the way this inability to loudly speak about it, inability to express it, um, and to call things as they are, um, is, is also something, again, problematic because we in Central Asia cannot even pronounce decolonization sometimes openly. And then it, it always has to be third parties that speak on our behalf, which is another second layer of silencing us. We're still getting over that pain of trying to understand what happened. And this is gonna be a different type of decolonization when we're trying to, to, to encapsulate it. There's a different sense of trauma, but then on, on, on the other hand, we also um, constantly silence down by others who speak of our experiences. So I think to me, Oilara is, is a very complex and a very prolonged, um, not only temporal, but also substantial and sort of uh, spa spatial understanding of that trauma and of that pain, which is a lot more complex than a very clear cut, okay, this is what happened and that's why you, you experience in this pain. So I would, I would probably encapsulate like that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Diana. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I would like also to uh, <clears throat> complain about the uh, about the installation now or on the on the floor that uh, I don't know. Maybe this is my feeling, my personal feeling, but I have. Um, that uh, our, uh, the souls of our ancestors are suffering and they uh, didn't get the uh, peace. Um, mm. So this idea uh, also pushes me to think, to, to create also this, uh, this kind of work. Um, maybe because we saw, because I'm, uh, when I see this old uh, carpet, which was also doing by hand, and they are still in the life. But their hands have passed away. So they left for us this um, Nasiridia legacy. A legacy. And this is what. Um, uh, moving so inside. Um, this is a natural. Uh, let's see that um, the wool, the material, everything is uh, like a hair, like a hair. Yeah. So uh, it's still in the life. So this is. Um, yeah, and uh, when I talk about my uncles, this is because I'm thinking that. They didn't want to go, but uh, they are not anymore there. So now they are in this um, in a list of this uh, the, with the souls of our ancestors. So this is crazy. This is like two years ago, but this is like like hundred years ago. But at the same time, it's like today. So this is that is a time uh, like. We yeah. are uh, playing uh, with emotions a lot. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. just to say it about the time, I think I, it's so true because um, one of the characteristics of trauma is this timelessness. So, timelessness. timelessness. Yes. So, what um, Freud was saying is that um, whatever is buried in our unconscious and is mm -hmm. not and then transformed, unconscious does not have a sense of time. So it is as exactly as you described, it's as alive as ever. And he mm -hmm. compared it also to archaeological um, 
uh, research that you, the, the, the deeper it's buried, the more intact it is. Mm -hmm. when, so the, the, in a way, this is why it's so important to, to be very revealed and thought about the moment, when, whenever, whenever, whatever is thought about and seen and smelled and experienced mm -hmm. and brought into this temporality, it can then be forgotten, it can turn into memory. In a way, trauma and memory are very mutually exclusive. So you have to turn it into a memory so that you can forget or you can remember. But trauma is something that is, um, has no, no time, it has timelessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I uh, have to work on it then. Yes. <laughs> yes. We, are, we, we all need to work on that because it's, uh, yeah. it's, we all have our own ghosts, uh, individual um, as well as uh, social. Yes, as a, both as individual and as Culture. a group. Yeah. Yes, it is. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, we've covered, I think, all the questions that we had about the pins, about the layers, about this. Um, your work, uh, which is uh, very rich, um, it gives. Uh, so, like you know, it works individually. Everyone finds their own uh, vision in it, and uh, there are many layers, uh, both revealing and conceiving, uh, re revealing and conceiving, and then all this um, talk that we had actually about uh, the trauma, traumatic experience, this repetitive and continuous process of it, and uh, I think you. You, you reflect everything in this horizon line and then you in this the mound of soil uh, that is actually we we spoke a little bit about it but um, I was planning to ask you maybe uh, Maya and Diana because uh, soil in a way um, you know what do you think about the presence of it I mean a lot of people when you, they see it, they consider it as a uh, uh, another side of mourning, obviously, but also as a... Um, uh, grave. Grave, as a grave. But then, uh, when you think about the soil itself, there is this maternal, fundamental source of life, you know? And it is uh, fascinating, but we discovered mushrooms, uh, <laughs> growing mushrooms in the soil, you know. So it's not only about the death and the end, but also about the birth and this, yeah. the life and the beginning, this nurturing, um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, n nurturing the organism <laughs> that grows in it. Uh, so, yes, maybe, I don't know, Diana, do you want to comment on it uh, in terms of... Um, soil as a field of identity formation maybe or like a homeland mm -hmm. yeah i think um phoebe and i spoke on the way here and, and um there there are a number of interesting projects right now with the soil and um in the Annale, for example one of my favorite works is by um i forgot it, audrey morales or something uh with the soil labyrinth uh describing and sort of like um going back to this history of south america and, mm. and, and um, rediscovering it. But I think um, for me, soil is becoming the, the major um, of, like source of decolonization, like a practical mm -hmm. source, uh, the very um, tangible source where, where people can take the soil from different places and work with it and try to, because the Morella's work, you can smell it and you can't touch it, but, but you can get lost in it and you can smell mm -hmm. the different smells of where it came from, like from South mm -hmm. America. That's that's um, really fantastic, but it's also going back to this idea of the climate catastrophe that uh, both colonization and capitalism um, kind of like destroyed that soil for such a long time. But I think in Kazakhstan, when I when I first saw the the grave, for me it was speaking quite largely of this project um, of modernization and trying to um, colonize the steppe mm -hmm. with uh, a number of different projects. Where soil was constantly, a Kazakh soil was constantly this object of, uh, you know, disruption, control, um, and the, the, the as Soviets we used to call it the victory of human over the nature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. um, and 
but our staff didn't give up. Uh, it didn't sort of like it didn't really get colonized. But then, nevertheless, it became a huge source and a huge language for the first generation of contemporary artists in Kazakhstan. Is to um, they did it almost subconsciously. They didn't understand why they were drawn to to soil so much, like the works of Saika Tabeka, for example. He still paints with soil, and when I ask him why why you do that, he says it's just something I feel like I have to do, but I can't really explain. So it's, it's, it is about the subconscious a lot, um, and maybe it's about some ancestral knowledge that we forgot, uh, that we were you know that was erased somehow over, over periods of time. And that's what Alma Gurman the Bible speaks about. So like I know that I lost certain knowledge, but I don't know how to. Uh, explain what knowledge that was. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of like you know work of, of psychoanalysis there, I think. Uh, but definitely, what what happens is that soil becomes this um, sort of uh, means of trans trans transiting from that lost knowledge or from. I don't think that knowledge is lost. It's, mm -hmm. it's probably somewhere at the back of our mind. We just need to extract it. But it also becomes this sort of formation now of thinking of the climate change on a larger scale and thinking what can we do with it and how do we find different answers to to save that particular so so you're not alone in this um exploration it's quite interesting i don't see death in in that particular installation actually uh, but i understand the connotation of graves what i see is reverse um a huge critique of sort of decolonization again decolonial critique and uh, some sort of hope so i don't see death there i think it's, it's a very hopeful word. i don't know what maya thinks I I had a I mean I would like to, I I would like to say that this was like um trying to help um utroba matri yeah womb of the mother yes this is the the ears yeah it's giving a birth so and. Uh, we are existing on these ears, yeah? Everything is growing uh, from the ears. Everything, like, of course, it's not only ears, but the base, basement. So, and then when the people die, we going back to the ears. So it was kind of this uh, membrana, kind of, um, yeah, so this is, uh, but at the same time, this is the ears for me is in the body. Yeah, but uh, uh, the pins and this, and this uh, um, flowers which is shining, but like a gold, but this is not, this is a fake. So it don't fit together with the ears, but this is what happens now. So this is this uh, also this uh, suffering, this uh, fragile. I mean, everything is very emotional. With uh, um, yeah. uh, for me, it's not the same thing with the uh, story. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do you want to add something? Uh, I think that. Uh, um, Kondo's uh, take on uh, soil very much uh, concerns the psychoanalytical vision of the the, the it's uh, the mother earth, uh, um, and uh, and it combines both. Uh, like you said, Kondo that the mother who gives uh, um, life and nurtures, but not so. So it's like you come out of the mother's womb and you go back into the grave. So mm -hmm. symbolically speaking, it's. Um, this is the maternal, maternal symbol, mm -hmm. the earth. Yes, and it was also the idea of Indira. Uh, um, she um, brought the Umay. Umay in our mythology is the mother of the earth. And uh, yes, we. Uh, uh, the name of the Ola Ara was also the idea from India because we were discussing a lot and uh, during our exchange and process working, uh, getting more deeper and deeper. So, yeah, maybe India also wants to say something. Yeah. About the soil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think uh, everything what I, 
I wrote in my text, it, it was already mentioned about this. Um, because, you know, like uh, Kazakhs, uh, nomads, nomads, not Kazakhs, uh, we used to believe in Tengri, and we were pagans before uh, Islam came to Central Asia. And uh, we referred a lot to Tengri, the sky god, and then the earth uh, mother, Umay, that feeds us, that gives the birth uh, to, yes, it, gi it gives life to us, but then we go back to it. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of reference, I think, that we've uh, discussed with Gulnur, and uh, yeah, it was this idea of uh, uh, bringing something organic, bringing this life and uh, motherly, motherly that connects to the body. And I think, uh, uh, the concept of body is present uh, in all works of Gulnur because she works also with felt and there are many works, uh, the sculptures uh, that she worked on previously and it also conceives this trauma, traumatic experience, this, uh, the skin uh, that, is so, uh, that is so visible and I mean um, I discuss it uh, a lot in my um, in my other work <laughs> that we will not discuss today, but uh, still, yes, Gunnar, um, I think your your work is very important. Same like uh, many uh, artists uh, who are working on uh, this identity, you know, the, the loss of identity, trying to remember um, and try. Uh, your work makes us think about it, analyze it, and we are remembering in this way. So that is importance of art being there. And actually I wanted to ask maybe Maya's take on it and uh, um, Diana's, uh, how can art or the exhibition space help us to maybe process uh, the moments of uncertainty, times of mourning and experiences of hopelessness, uh, loss and perhaps uh, hope? Okay, sorry. Maybe, so it's, maybe, maybe this question is very good for the audience as well because <laughs> they are the ones who come and uh, yeah, so experience uh, all the time. I think this is. Uh, Should I turn the camera so that I can see the audience? Yes. Yeah, yeah, let's turn the What was the difficult? Uh, the difficult is to, to when you try to go to give everything out to express the um, the uh, concept. This is the most difficult thing when you try. Uh, Every day, when you are working with, yeah, for like I don't know, hundred percent or more, yeah, to give maximum to express it, to yeah, visually to express it. Mm -hmm. And the second one, uh, is there anything that you don't like in your work here or upstairs? <laughs> 
the thing that you are unhappy or something, maybe a part of something? Actually, um, there is a when the, the, the show was created for the space, so I already imagined how they uh, look like in more, uh, also uh, calculated how many meters I have to do. Um, I think I have uh, this feeling to uh, complain with uh, more like with the horizontal line to uh, for the next show yeah, to complain with the original line like this is in our culture they change uh, passport this was for the youth to hold the youth yeah so I think uh, more in this uh, direction mm. yeah. you, mean, you mean continue continue yes okay. mm -hmm. Um, continue um, um, complain. Complain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, but it's then. But then it's a new Spandard. work. Yes, it's uh, to, develop. to develop your work further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, something I think was being touched on a bit at the end uh, is, do you find hope in this process of mourning? Is there, is there hope to be found? And I was also wondering about the difference you find in the process of working with Synthetic materials compared to organic materials. Did you hear that? No, I didn't hear uh, uh, the last uh, uh, What's yeah. the difference between working with synthetic and organic? Есть ли разница, когда ты работаешь с синтетической тканью и органической? И есть ли надежда вот в твоей работе? Ты видишь надежду? Я работаю над этим, да. Я работаю над этим, and I try to, I'm, uh, um, passage, um, uh, 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 Это на самом деле такой личный опыт для this is the, um, why I start to also why I start to work with the synthetic fabrics. This actually at first they um, they took my attention because they were so shiny, so brightly, so colorful, at the same time so kitsch, and uh, uh, also because um, they this is the cheap fabrics. But uh, I saw the people um, selling it on the market in the winter in Kazakhstan, it was like 40 degrees. Yeah, people anyway staying outside and selling to survive. So uh, it was, I, and then I started to think, yeah, why? So uh, where is the, uh, ah, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I 
phenomenon set in yeah. the <laughs> Something where uh, 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 не про не это про слово мне сейчас не выходит из рта. Справедливость. Справедливость, да, 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 да. Где это справедливость? So, yeah. <laughs> Спасибо. И если я не ставлю, first I start to work with the to do this fabrics and then to mix it with the felt because the felt is the basic material I'm, I'm working on. And uh, then I uh, slowly now starting to uh, uh, collect uh, also some old uh, silk uh, fabrics uh, from Uzbekistan. I'm also interested to work with the fabrics from other cultures like uh, from I don't know, like India, from uh, um, uh, Morocco, from uh, Africa, uh, from everywhere. This is because they have also the, the same, uh, uh, the same problems, the same uh, topics to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, this is because this is this is a, this is a global exchange. Yeah. So this is another point. But uh, how this art bring us together, and uh, what you can, uh, how do, how can I uh, use it as a mixing, but in a good way, and uh, like uh, not only to say only the ne negative uh, things, stuffs from globalization, but to see also some uh, this connections between the cultures, but yeah, in another way. Thank you, Bruno. Um, maybe there are questions on Zoom as well? Um, I do have a question. Yes, please. So, um, hello. So first of all, thank you very much for the great um, presentation, Bruno. It was really interesting and really interested into your works. So my question is about globalization. So you're speaking about globalization and in your works and a mixture of different cultures. And in the moment, what do you think? Is it end of era of globalization or it's something in the future? I mean, what do you think about it? Oh, did you ask this kind of questions? No, 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 this is not the end. I think, uh, but uh, when we talk about globalization, it's the first, uh, why it happened is because of economical, uh, economy of uh, the with global getting more uh, independent from each other, so. <coughs> But then uh, the, the cultural uh, starts getting also um, um, losing um, during this cooperation with other cultures or with the uh, um, uh, uh, impact. Impact. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I don't know. I'm just uh, um, trying to to uh, uh, to understand, to follow at the same time, make our own uh, opinion and uh, analyzing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's I think very complicated. It is very complex. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Gunnar, I think there is also like uh, the, the series of works upon globalization uh, that you have, where again you are speaking about the identity and this loss of identity because of globalization, actually. So there is this link about the, okay. uh, again going back to thinking mm -hmm. about the identity and the loss of identity. Yes, this is a. Uh, uh 
Yeah, this, uh, in, in, in this work, this is what the work is that I, I did uh, the masks with hair uh, from my face. So it's this, I don't know, tightening that mask and then glue it together. Like in this work, I uh, yes, try to, uh, when I was seeing that there is some people who constantly hating or getting on uh, the impact of other cultures without thinking about himself, where, who I am and where I am and what I'm, uh, where I'm going. So, and some people doing it unconsciously and consciously. So this was the idea of this, uh, um, um, the idea to think about, yeah, about the uh, transformation of, uh, yeah, transformation of traditional values through the globalization. So we have last five minutes uh, to finalize. Uh, is there any questions in the audience or on Zoom? Could I just ask a question, which is um, your reason for choosing fabric, what it means to you as a, as a medium? Uh, I didn't hear so well. Uh, Например, не работаешь с живописью, да, ты предпочитаешь работать с тканью. Во-первых, I was studying at the, uh, in Kazakhstan, I studied at textile, uh, uh, textile uh, faculty. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did a lot of experimentation with uh, different uh, Textiles like a pad, like uh, making carpet, uh, drawing on silk, uh, and other uh, traditional techniques with the uh, wool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think I uh, um, was feeling more because this is this tactility. Yeah, it's uh, developed uh, a lot. Uh, when I came to Germany, I want to study textile design. I want to try something more, something different, because design was uh, 10 years ago. No, I guess 10 years ago it was uh, like a uh, modern uh, profession, like, I you know, something cool. So um, I want to try to get um, uh, how to say to go with the others together, yeah? to don't lost like on the side, to go with the everybody, like. And uh, after my um, study, I I came back to the health. So all my work, uh, my diploma and uh, uh, master work was uh, from health, so sculptures and uh, photography did. Um, Extra for the uh, for the photos, photography works also. Mm -hmm. Yes, something what I feel more activity and also I think because the pad is something what's really connecting me to with this uh, with the roots. Yes. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the meaning of soil. So I just wondered if there was a particular you know, resonance with fabric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the soil, yeah, because this is also this, uh, this natural, natural yeah. material, so you feel it, you, you smell it. Yeah, exactly. It came also naturally with the... Yeah. But uh, so it's doing, yeah, mm -hmm. doing yeah, this it's exchange with the Indira, yeah. <laughs> Can you have given this idea to use the soil? <laughs> Not that I gave you the idea, but we were discussing it. But um, uh, actually, thinking about this, um, the soil, uh, the soil or the felt, uh, this organic uh, material, it's mm -hmm. also it refers to the body. Again, we're going back to the body, and then when you work uh, uh, with the uh, felt sculptures and making yeah. felt, uh, 
uh, you're not buying the, actually the ready-made felt. You take the wool and then you make it with your hands. You know, like all this process um, that involves the body again. Your own body and others' bodies as well, yeah. because uh, wool also comes from the body. So it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Animal, but still a uh, black a yeah. 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 Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Gunnur. Thank you, Diana and uh, Maya, for joining us today. Uh, I think it was a wonderful conversation. And thank you for the audience as well for joining. Uh, it's the last day so, of the exhibition. So tomorrow is the last day, actually. So we are happy that we managed to organize this talk. And thank you for everyone who joined on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a question, for interest, for everything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.